Hi everyone, um, welcome to the CPHE webinar series. My name is Lauren and I'll begin the webinar session today um, by presenting um, on my Masters by Research topic, which is dysphagia in young adults with cerebral palsy. I'd like to open by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's spiritual connection to country and by acknowledging the First Peoples, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. I respectfully acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging and the wisdom and spiritual connection that they've passed on. And I extend this respect to Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander colleagues and guests who are present today. I would also like to acknowledge, um, as this content is from my Master of Philosophy project, which is very near to submission, um, my wonderful supervisory team, Dr. Hans Bogart and Associate Professor Kimberly Docking. I'd um, also like to give a special thanks to Professor Susan Ballenden and Ms. Stephanie Knizhnik, who supported with the write-up and data analysis of my systematic review, and Professor Prue Morgan from the CP Achieve CRE, who has provided me with some informal support for parts of my project. I'd like to begin by describing the focus of my project, which is dysphagia. Dysphagia can be defined as the dysfunction of one or more parts of the swallowing apparatus. It can present at the oral level, where it affects the lips, tongue and cheeks, at the pharyngeal level, where it affects the throat, including the epiglottis and pharynx, or a combination of both known as oropharyngeal dysphagia. As I'm sure most of you are aware, CP is a condition that affects the development of movement and posture. What you may not be aware of is that up to 50.4% of individuals with CP are affected by oropharyngeal dysphagia. Research has also shown that there is a higher chance of dysphagia in individuals with CP who are on the more severe end of the GMFCS scale. So children and adults who present as GMFCS level five with severe motor impairments are more likely to have dysphagia. First off, we thought a bit about why so many people with CP have dysphagic symptoms. Um, we know that CP is due to damage to the developing brain, including the neural pathways for both motor and sensory information. And we also know that in children with CP who have dysphagia, this damage to the developing brain most commonly leads to um, poor tongue function and delayed swallow initiation at the oral level of dysphagia. Um, as well as silent aspiration at the pharyngeal level where food, fluid or saliva enters the airway upon swallowing. There isn't enough research at this stage to know whether these symptoms are also present in adults with CP, um, but we do believe this to be quite likely. There is an emerging body of evidence to suggest that a large proportion of young adults with CP are regularly being admitted to hospital to access acute inpatient services for emergency health care. One of the main reasons for these hospital admissions is respiratory illness, including pneumonia. It's also been found that people with CP who have oropharyngeal dysphagia and frequent respiratory symptoms are at risk of hospitalisation. Dysphagia intervention research is heavily underrepresented in the CP population. Some studies have focused on the exploration of dysphagia in children with CP, attempting to develop suitable interventions for its management but there's very limited evidence available for effective and efficient intervention practices to manage oropharyngeal dysphagia in adults with CP. So this research gap has meant that there are no clinical guidelines to support clinicians to effectively manage dysphagia when treating adults with CP. And an interesting point to note, I guess, at this point is that intervention for people with acquired dysphagia um, due to acquired conditions such as stroke um, is actually relatively well established in the literature and in clinical practice among speech pathologists. Um, so interestingly, there are, there's no research for how these direct interventions, such as active swallow exercise, can be applied to adults with CP or whether these strategies are even effective at all. So my master's project um, aimed firstly to explore the current research available for non-surgical treatment approaches or behavioural treatment approaches that are implemented by speech pathologists for the direct management of dysphagia in adults with CP. We explored this by completing a systematic review. The second aim of the project was to explore the intersection between dysphagic symptoms, emotional quality of life and health in a sample of young adults with CP. And we did this by constructing an online survey where we asked a sample of young adults with CP questions about dysphagic symptoms, quality of life and general health. We really wanted to explore this as the precursor to developing a suitable and effective intervention for adults with CP because we felt that we really need to hear from young adults themselves about the impacts of dysphagia on their lives before we even attempt to explore 
intervention methods. Um, and the third aim of the study, which was also addressed through the online survey, was to find out whether young adults with CP access speech pathology services for their dysphagia. We decided to set quite strict uh, guidelines for the study criteria because we really wanted to get a clear picture of what was available in the evidence base for dysphagia intervention as conducted by speech pathologists with adults with CP. So using the search terms listed, we considered studies that included adults with dysphagia associated with CP, um, as well as papers that reported on non-surgical interventions, um, such as behavioural um, interventions like positioning, oral stimulation and caregiver training, as well as nutritional approaches such as fluid thickness and altering food consistency. We excluded um, studies that were written in a language other than English, that were continuing to recruit participants, that involved participants with dysphagic presentations primarily due to other medical conditions, not CP, um, that were exploring surgical, medical or pharmaceutical interventions for dysphagia, such as botulinum toxin. Um, we also excluded studies that included children under the age of 18 years. So it was quite strict criteria for that, um, but also really broad search terms. Um, so based on the criteria and the search terms that we used across multiple databases, um, the results yielded a total of one paper for review. And when the quality of evidence for this paper was reviewed using the grade approach, it was found to be low. So I suppose that gives you a bit of an indication as to how limited the research currently is in this area and the urgency with which high quality research into this field is absolutely warranted. The implications for practice um, are essentially that speech pathologists are unable to provide evidence-based treatment for adults with CP. Um, and the implications for future research from this was um, that we really need to develop a deeper understanding of the swallowing and mealtime experiences of adults with CP and dysphagia, because it is only with this information that appropriately designed interventions that are safe, effective and sustainable can be developed. So the next paper of the project was a survey study exploring dysphagia in a sample of young adults with CP. So our participants were initially recruited through the New South Wales ACT Cerebral Palsy Register. Um, a recruitment email and letter were sent to individuals on the CP register who met the inclusion criteria for the study and who'd previously um, agreed to be contacted to invite participation in research. Recruitment emails were also sent to Cerebral Palsy Alliance therapy teams for distribution. Individuals who expressed interest in being involved in the study were contacted by the primary researcher via phone or email. And a 30 minute Zoom or phone call was scheduled with the participants and their carers, if appropriate, to complete the eligibility process. So our participants needed to have either no or mild intellectual disability and they needed to be able to read and understand English. This was because they needed to be able to answer the survey questions on their own. Some participants were permitted to have support from a family member or a support person for computer access to complete the survey. Um, and after <laughs> that long process, we recruited eight adults um, from New South Wales to, to participate in the study. So the survey was constructed using the Qualtrics platform and was structured to include five sections for the collection of quantitative data. So the sections included participant demographics, speech pathology services accessed within the previous two years, and that included um, both assessment and intervention. The dysphagia handicap index or the DHI, which is a standardized tool for assessing the impact of dysphagia symptoms on quality of life. The nutrition and swallowing risk checklist or the NSRC, which is a criterion referenced uh, clinical and research tool for collecting information about an individual's swallowing or nutrition concerns, um, and the EQ5D5L, which is a health outcomes measure that's widely used in health and medical research to determine the cost effectiveness of healthcare, but also to provide a well-rounded description of a person's health from their own perspective. So this is the first study to explore the self-reported dysphagic symptoms of a sample of young adults with CP. No studies to date have used valid and reliable measures such as the DHI to investigate dysphagia in this population. Due to limited participant numbers, our results focused on descriptive and within subject analyses with non-parametric statistics to identify trends for further exploration in future research. Between subject analyses were also conducted, however, interpretation of these results was made with caution based on participant numbers. So as you can see in the table, six of the eight participants had a swallowing disorder based on their DHI scores. And this result is in line with current research regarding the prevalence of dysphagia, um, which I mentioned earlier to be at least 50.4%. So further to this, only three participants had seen a speech pathologist in the previous two years. And the average DHI score was 10, 
which is fairly high considering that you only need to score three to indicate the presence of the swallowing disorder. I won't read all of these out, um, but this slide just gives you an idea of the primary symptoms and issues that were identified on the DHI and the NSRC questions per survey. Some of the symptoms listed are indicators or risk factors of aspiration pneumonia, such as coughing when eating, needing to drink fluids for food to go down, choking on medications and being physically dependent on others to eat or drink. Only one of the six dysphagic participants um, indicated that they follow a modified diet. And this person had not seen a speech pathologist in the previous two years. Um, although pharyngeal face symptoms such as coughing, gagging, choking and chest infections were indicated by some of the participants, um, it appeared that oral phase issues were the most prevalent in this sample of young adults with CP, where four participants reported drooling and five reported anterior loss of food or fluid during mealtimes. Swelling problems are frequently reported in a range of patient groups. Um, T-tests were performed to explore the, diff the possible differences between the scores on the DHI in our cohort and scores reported in other studies. So this table presents an overview of the current findings and the DHI scores in three different studies in other populations. The DHI scores in our cohort were higher than in a healthy ageing population and in a population with whiplash, um, but they were lower in uh, stroke patients. Interesting to note, there was no statistically significant difference found between any of the results in our cohort compared with the healthy elderly or stroke patients on the DHI. So this is really interesting in that it highlights that there are no differences between dysphagia symptoms in this group of young adults with CP and other dysphagic patients where research is quite a bit more prevalent. Um, so it's definitely imperative that we don't forget our adults with CP um, and how dysphagia impacts their health and their safety. So based on the results that we obtained, um, it's clear that this small sample of young adults with CP experienced dysphagic symptoms at both the oral and pharyngeal levels of the swallow. We found some initial trends emerging between dysphagic symptoms, emotional quality of life and general health, but further research in this area is warranted to build a greater understanding of the impacts of dysphagia in this population and with a larger sample size. It was determined from this study that the majority of young adults with CP are not accessing speech pathology services for their dysphagic symptoms, despite their severity. And we also found that young adults with CP were underestimating the severity of their dysphagic symptoms, as well as their health status, which led to questions about the suitability of self-report outcome measures for this population and why this underestimation might occur. The sample size was one limitation of this study. The COVID-19 pandemic had a big impact on recruitment. However, um, consumer involvement could have also led to a larger sample size. This is something to definitely consider in future research. The suitability of outcome measures was also a factor as the DHI could have been simplified. This leads to the need for more appropriate outcome measures for dysphagia in the CP population to account for potential language or cognitive delays that may impact a person's ability to answer questions or provide um, accurate information. So all in all, future research should focus on consumer-based research where young adults with CP are included in discussions around project development and their concerns for dysphagia and research aims. Um, we need to look at objective assessment for dysphagia in a sample of young adults with CP, including video fluoroscopy studies, so that we can better understand the characteristics of dysphagia and its impacts on function and safety. We need to explore intervention studies where direct intervention methods such as swallow exercise or, um, and or neuromuscular electrical stimulation are considered. We need to develop appropriate self-report measures for dysphagia. Um, and we might consider looking at something like focus groups to discuss barriers for accessing speech pathology services with young adults themselves. So to conclude, young adults with CP are a vulnerable population who are underrepresented in the research, particularly with regards to dysphagia. Um, this project demonstrated a high prevalence of dysphagia in the population who were not presently managed. Um, a large proportion of the study participants had not accessed speech pathology services in the previous two years, so this could suggest in inadequate screening of dysphagia in this population. And although this study yielded a limited number of responses, it does raise concerns about the current management of dysphagia in young adults with CP. Just a couple of reference slides for your interest. 